for allowing me to share my experience with him, with you today. Uh, like Dr. Jamin mentioned that I work in addition to uh, him, I work with sweet sorghum, forage sorghum, grain sorghum, millet, forage millet, grain millet, and sweet stem millet. And we also have hibiscus cannabis can have that's used for fiber. I have two students working on GWAS and sunflower too. Uh, I started my interest in him back in 2012. I don't know if you remember the drought back in that 2012, I was driving around the sorghum field and the only green thing I see is the sorghum and the hemp. So now, I could said, you, wow. Can you start sharing the slides again? Sorry. Oh. That's my disruption, I acknowledged. <laughs> oh, Sorry. no, it's not. I thought it's sharing, no? No, it's not sharing. Yeah. All right. Oh, how did we do that? All right, let me see. Okay, it's showing up and then you can project. Thank you. You see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay, <clears throat> so then I saw that the hemp is still green and we have really bad drought with almost 40 days with no rain at that time. So I said, well, okay, maybe that's a new crop for me. So what I'm gonna do uh, throughout the seminar, first, I'm gonna give you some background and introduction about him. Um, some of you may already know it, but for some will be new information. And then we'll proceed to the uh, germplasm collection and then the breeding uh, goals. So hemp is a, or industrial hemp, cannabis species. There are three different species of hemp. Cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis rudialis. Uh, most of the fiber hemp and grain hemp is cannabis sativa. Cannabis indica that's used for uh, what we call it marijuana because it's helped you to go to sleep. And the rudialis has the uh, de neutral genes that uh, been uh, moved from rudialis to sativa and indica. Uh, hemp is a diesis blend. It's like, so breeding hemp is like breeding cows or a human. Uh, hemp is uh, belong to the cannabaceae family and one of its closest relative is hops. Hops has been used uh, uh, for beer production and this family called the medicinal family because both these uh, species are being used for medicinal reason in, in addition to as an agronomic crops. Where did hemp come from? It's very important to know the origin of diversity for any crop if you are going to intend to do breeding with it. So hemp came from the Himalayan mountain and then moved from the Himalayan mountain to the Middle East and from the Middle East to the uh, North America in early, 19, in early 1500s. Uh, an early in the discussion about the domestication of hemp back in the maybe 10,000 years ago, uh, people saw plants like this and they, it's a new to them. So they start using it as to burn it or to cook with it. So one day they burn it, they went to sleep and they felt good. So they said, oh, we need to save this plant. So they start saving the seeds and take the seeds with them as they travel from one region to the other. And that's how the hemp spread out the uh, Southeast Asia and from Southeast Asia moved to Europe and the United States and to South America. You could see wild hemp also in Canada. Canada has been uh, breeding hemp for the past 50 years. So they are ahead of us by at least 40 years. And it's more advanced breeding programs are in Europe, like Italy, Poland, 
and Russia. So we are so much behind other European country and Canadian and Russia and China in terms of uh, hemp breeding. Hemp likes uh, well fertile soil and whenever you see spring, there is always a chance to see hemp. So they like water. So hemp spread uh, backward started 10,000 years ago and spread over and people started growing it for fiber and for uh, other medicinal reason. So the first uh, federal law came in 1937, banned hemp for use, called it the Ta Marijuana Tax Act, and then have the Control Substance Act in 1970. So that's banned all the production of hemp for any reason. But during World War II, we used to get uh, our uh, fiber from the Philippines. And then the Japanese invaded the, the Philippines. So the United States had no longer was getting uh, fiber from the Philippines. So they mandated the farmers in the Midwest, Iowa, Nebraska, and uh, Kansas to grow hemp for fiber. They call it hemp for war. So they grow about 4,000 acres of hemp for three, four years. And then after the war ended, the government said, okay, there is a ban on hemp again. So nobody was growing it after that. <clears throat> and then there is so much interest started back. Uh, people are, we don't want to grow hemp as a crop, mostly in Kentucky and the Midwest. So President Obama passed the Farm Bill in 2014, which allow uh, the universities and uh, USDA uh, labs to conduct uh, pilot study on hemp research. And in two 2018, President Trump passed the Farm Bill that contained hemp where everybody could grow hemp. As long as you grow, you grow hemp that has less than 0.3% THC. You could grow hemp anywhere in the world except up in the Arctic. So you could grow it in Africa, you could grow it in Russia, China, Canada, in the United States, Africa, there is everywhere. So it's uh, an easy crop to grow and it could uh, accommodate in any climate. So hemp produce seed, produce fiber, and it produce medicinal uh, uh, ingredient. Uh, hemp seed contain about 30% oil and about 25% protein. Both of them are with a high nutrition uh, value. And the oil is rich in oleic acid and the protein contain all the essential amino acid in it. So it's a called superfood. It's good uh, food to eat, put in your smoothies or in your cereal in the morning. Uh, as I mentioned, it's contain all the 20 essential amino acid. Also it has uh, uh, omega-3 and omega-6 uh, acids in, in a ratio of two to one which is ideal for the human body consumption. So it's very rich in the omega-3 and omega-6. <clears throat> so hemp grown for grain seed could produce up to 1,200 pounds per acre. And it depends on the market. You could fetch between 40 cents to $1.23 to $1 per pound. If you are growing it organically, you get about three times more income, they're the same amount. That will translate about to 40 gallons of oil. So you could buy hemp oil and it would be about 40 gallons per acre. And it's very easy and it will establish a process to extract oil from hemp. Also hemp could be used for fiber and one acre could produce up to 1300 pounds of pure fiber and you could fetch up to 70 cents to a dollar 80 uh, per pound. If you're growing it organically, you could 
uh, make about two and a half more money if uh, of him as a grown organically compared to the standard way. Uh, method for separating uh, fiber from him, we don't really have any processing f facilities yet advanced in the United States. Most of the processing facilities that uh, are in Europe, Canada, and China. So there are so many investors trying to establish or start uh, uh, hemp processing facilities here in the uh, United States, but so far I don't really know of any existing uh, uh, processing hemp for fiber. And you could see here on the lower uh, right end, you could see how the fiber get extracted or get the outside la layer of the stock is the fiber for hemp that will be extracted. And there are several ways to extracting it. You could do it mechanically. You could just leave it on the ground for two, three weeks, and then you could separate the fiber from the inner stock. One other use for hemp is you could use it for plastic and paint. And if you could, if you make uh, uh, plastic from hemp, it's very degradable compared to the plastic. In 58 days, the whole bottle will degrade him from plastic. Okay. So it'll be safer for the environment. You could use hemp also for uh, making houses, building houses, call it hempcrete, and the hempcrete, you take the inner stock of the hemp and you mix it with gypsum and water, and you make these blocks of concrete. So you could build houses with it. That's what discovered more than 5,000 years ago that the Egyptians and the Chinese were using it as a building material. And also you could use the extracted oil from the seed to produce biodiesel. One acre of hemp could produce up to 600 gallons of biodiesel. Also, we are working with a group of uh, uh, researcher in uh, University of Illinois, where after we harvest the stock, uh, harvest the seed, they take the stocks and then you could uh, extract lipids from the stocks. And one acre of hemp, uh, that, uh, the, the lipid from hemp, but from the one acre produce up to uh, the same amount of biodiesel as one acre of soybean produce. So in addition to the grain, you could use the, extract the lipid from the stock to produce uh, ethanol and biodiesel. Hemp were used also in building cars back in the early 1900s. And you see that uh, Henry Ford built his car from hemp. And you could see some of the German car also has hemp material that got into them to, for production. One of the major uses of hemp also is uh, hemp is used as bioremediated crop. For bioremediation, hemp is known to be a hyper accumulator of uh, heavy metals from the soil. Example of using it for bioremediation, the Russian is still using it to uh, clean up the soil after the Chernobyl uh, radioactive uh, breakdown more than 25 years ago. So it's hyper accumulator of uh, uh, heavy metals like technetium, radioactive material, zinc. Uh, one main uses of hemp also is uh, as a medicinal. I'm sure most of you are is familiar with CBD. It's being used for sleep disorder, for uh, arthritis, for uh, anti-inflammation drug. Uh, epilepsy, the USDA already, or the FDA already approved an epilepsy drugs from him. So there are so many different uses uh, for him. In addition to people are getting high by smoking the hemp that contain high concentration of THC. So back in uh, 2014, after the farm bill passed by President Obama, uh, 
I, I and the university applied for a permit from the DEA and it took us about eight months to get it. Anyhow, we got the permit and then uh, we said, okay, you could work with hemp now, but we don't have any seed. They said the only seed you could use is seed that coming from overseas, certified seed, certified seed that any industrial hemp that contain less than 0.3% THC. So we bought some seed from Canada and from Europe. So the Canadian hemp, I grew it in the greenhouse under 14 hours and you could see here, looks like Arabidopsis to me. I grew it in the uh, greenhouse and then after 40 days, it start flowering. As I mentioned earlier, hemp is photoperiod sensitive. So hemp that's uh, originated in Canada, it's adapted to long days, 18 hours and more during the growing season. When you bring it down here to uh, Nebraska and the uh, Midwest, it senses the short days, so it starts flowering quickly. So, we grow it in the field in here. We have we grow it in two different seasons. 2017, we planted the hemp at the end of June. At the end of June, and then in October, the plant reaches about seven feet tall. When we planted in 2018, in early May, the plant flower up after 50 days. The reason for that, because when you plant it in May, the day length is about 13 hours or less. So the plant is start sensing that it's time to start flowering. When you plant it in June or end of June, we have 14 hours day length. So the plant said, well, still, I still have time. So the only sense that flowering when it's at the end of July and August start flowering. So that's a, is a make a huge difference when to blend him because it's for the very sensitive. You have to know when to blend it. So you could see here in the hand, right hand side of the field is a wild hemp that you could find throughout the Midwest. And you could see the same date where I took that picture in the field, you could see the wild hemp. It's much taller and it's still about three, four weeks behind in flowering. So that's said, hey, why don't we use the wild hemp to start breeding hemp in Nebraska and instead of buying hemp seed from Canada and Europe? <clears throat> because if you are growing the wrong hemp variety, you are not going to make much money out of it. The plant are not going to be produce high yield because it's going to mature early. So cannabis probably need to be bred like soya bean into maturity group. As South is going to have different variety than the variety that you could grow up in Wisconsin and Minnesota and uh, Montana. So that's why it's, we should develop maturity group hemp based on the uh, latitude. Longer maturity group hemp is going to produce higher yield. So since the Canadian and the Italian variety did not work well for us, so, and we have thousands of acres of wild hemp in Nebraska, and that's what, based on my experience back in 2012, so I decided, well, maybe we should take advantage of that wild hemp that's already adapted for the past 200 years in Nebraska. Maybe we should use it as a starting material for our breeding program. So I start uh, going around and uh, collecting hemp seed from all the counties in Nebraska. We have 93 counties. And the reason also beside, we don't have really access to any germplasm like you have here in uh, grain. And uh, so you could get your uh, corn seed and soybean seed and sorghum seed. We don't have any germplasm collection for hemp yet. They are going to establish one. They are in the process of establishing one in Ithaca Cornell. 
uh, uh, last year and a year before, we were prohibited from getting seed from uh, other countries. So it makes sense to start taking advantage of the wild hemp that we have in here. And you can see I have several pictures in here of how different phenotype, plant height, that's a male, that's a female. Even from the same location, you could see so much variability. This one is cold, less cold sensitive than the green one. So you could see it's growing in here between the weeds. And that's a big batch of the hemp in here. So there's a huge variation for it. So for the past three, four years, I've been collecting hemp from the different counties in Nebraska. And you could see in uh, the, there is a huge variation in terms of rainfall and climate uh, condition in, in Nebraska. The west side, it's sandy, and we get about 12 inches of rain annually or less. The east side, it's more fertile soil, more deep soil, and we get about 28 to 34 inches of rain. So which makes sense that you see more hemp in the eastern and central side of, the, of Nebraska compared to when you go out west because it's sand hill, it's sandy. So this material that's being collected from this western side of Nebraska would be ideal to screen for drought tolerance in them, okay? Because they are adapted to drought and sandy soil. So based on this, we decided to see, let's see how much variation among these different counties, the wild hen. So we chose 17 different counties and we took two samples from each county that are at least 25 miles apart. Extracted the DNA and uh, sequenced them. And you could see there is a huge differences even within one counties from sample that collected from the same counties that are so different. The only, uh, we have seven and eight is collected from one county here, 17 and 18, and there is one more in here, uh, one and uh, two and three. And the rest of them are, these are collected from the same county, but they are different. So, which that tell us that there is a huge differences within the same county because hemp pollen can travel up to 100 miles if it's dry and windy. That's one of the main obstacles we have in hemp breeding. You have pollen that fly everywhere and you have a dioecious blend. So, it's very hard to control it. So in the field, we start uh, doing some experiment. We have up in the top left here, we have uh, hemp for CBD grown at 5,000 plants per acre. Uh, the bottom underneath it, you see hemp for CBD and hemp for grain. You could see the difference in terms of architecture that the hemp for grain is almost one branch or two, and the hemp for CBD looks like a Christmas tree. And you could see the corn behind me here. I'm about five, seven tall, and this is the hemp. That's grown at 5,000 plants per acre. You could see how big that blend. And all that hemp is received is about 100 pounds of nitrogen at the beginning of the planting. That's it. No irrigation. It's a rain-fed 100 pounds of nitrogen at planting time. And that's how, what you see in here. And we were able to get about two pounds of dry weight per blend. So in addition to the field uh, research, we have also, we are conducting research in the greenhouse, which is more controlled environment. So we'll be able to control the pollen and make our crosses in the, the greenhouse or in the gross chamber. So you could take the female, put in a gross chamber and then take pollen from a uh, male in the greenhouse and put it in the uh, female in the gross chamber so you could at least uh, eliminate any cross contamination. It's not an easy process, but it's, it's fun. 
So cannabis is not an easy plant to breed. Uh, first, because it's dioecious. You have male and female plant and uh, male and female on separate plants. It's a uh, very day, 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 day length sensitive. So it's only flower when the day becomes short. Uh, pollen survive har uh, harsh condition like dry weather and windy uh, condition. We don't have really a, a, an established core cannabis germplasm in the United States. They have some in Russia, there are some in China, but we don't have any in the United States. Uh, so we need that uh, uh, centralized uh, core blend collection, hopefully to become soon. So we'll, be, we'll have access to it for the blend breeders. <clears throat> so it's, uh, the way you make crosses in him, it's you take pollen from the male, that's on the right hand side. If it's in the greenhouse, you collect it in a Ziploc bag, you put it in a bed brush and you put it in the female. And then you see here, you could cover it after that. Or if you have, you wanna make mass selection process, you have conduct mass uh, selection process in the field or in the greenhouse, you put a few, uh, males with females and let them enter a cross. Or you could do diarrheal crosses where you have only females and one male that's going to pollinate up to a 200 female. <clears throat> so pollination happens when male pollen come in contact with the female and usually male flower two weeks ahead of the female and stay producing pollen for up to 12 weeks. And the female stay receptive for almost two months. So that is an advantage where you could uh, uh, save pollen and uh, female, and you could use different uh, branches of the female to cross it to different male. So you could, after you make the crosses, you could bag it. And then if you don't want to use the male anymore, you could just spray it with water. Because after you spray it with water, you kill the pollen. Uh, pollen, it's, you could save it in the freezer up to two, three years. So you could collect the pollen from your favorite male. And if you don't have your favorite female at that time, you could collect the pollen like you see in here, I just shake it in a uh, plastic or uh, aluminum foil. And then you collect the pollen and put it in a Ziploc bag and put the this desiccant this, this in it and put it in the freezer. And you could save it up to two, three years. And whenever you need a male pollen, you could go back to your freezer. And if you want to use that male to pollinate any female that you have now, you could just take the pollen and puts in the female. <clears throat> so hemp is a diploid, it has 20 chromosome. And you see that the Y chromosome is a little bit longer than the X chromosome. Uh, the genome size about 818 mega base bear. So. Uh, what are breeding goals I have in here. Uh, I have several breeding goals. One of them is the water and nutrient or natural use of shansi. Uh, hemp that you collected from the wild has, is, has a shattering trait on it. So seed, when they mature, they just fall on the ground. So you wanna eliminate the shattering traits, uh, enhance the cold tolerance, uh, increase the accumulation of phytocannabinoids like CBD, CBG, CBA, CBS. Increase the seed size, so it'll be easier to process. Uh, eliminate the dormancy. All the wild hemp that's grown in Nebraska, Indiana, Iowa, all the Midwest has strong seed dormancy. So if you collect the seed, 
from the wild hemp and you try to germinate it, it won't germinate. So you have to put it in the freezer for at least two months to break the dormancy or treat it with different chemicals to break the dormancy. So it's a big problem in hemp is the seed dormancy. Uh, you don't see that many uh, insect and diseases in wild hemp. In the, if you grow it in the greenhouse, yes, you are going to have butter mildew, you are going to have white fly, you are going to have spider mites. So we are hopefully trying to develop resistance for these. And what we are doing by going out to the germplasm that's already been in the field year in and year out for the past 200 years, the strong that the plant survived, the stronger survives. So that has less disease, has less insect, and that's have better adaptation. Okay, so this is some example also of the uh, hemp that we are collecting from Western Nebraska from the Sand Hill. And we are trying to use this for ability to survive harsh environment, drought, water, use efficiency, because these plants could produce seed, but they are not uh, good to look at, look at now, but uh, hopefully it will be a good source for us. This is seed, seed showering. You could see in here, this is, we left the seed uh, on the plants past October, and you see the seed fall from the plants and then start germinating. This is Canadian hemp, so it's not wild hemp. The, cultivar that you buy from seed companies don't have seed dormancy. Weed, weed is a major problem in him because we don't have that many uh, re registered herbicide for him because it's a new crop in here and companies haven't invested that much money in producing, producing herbicide for uh, him. So the only way to do it for now is to hand weed. We just go and control the weed by hand. The other way is you could see me here uh, was when I was collecting him, I see a cornfield. It's clean. The only thing you see is wild him. It's in the middle of the field. And this field was, has been sprayed for several uh, herbicide, including Roundup. So there is a potential that this hemp plant could have or could uh, be resistant to some of the herbicides. So we have to test these and see if they have obtained the resistance. The seed size, you could see there is about eight times difference in seed size in hemp, and that's popcorn. You could see the difference in here. So when a farmer said how many bounds of hemp I need to blend an acre, the best thing to say how many, how many, how many bound, how many seeds or how many plants you need. Because one bound of hemp that has big seed is going to, going to contain less seed than one bound of hemp that has smaller seed. So the best way to do it is how many plants to grow per acre. Usually if you are growing hemp for grain, we recommend about 150,000 plants per acre. If you are growing it for fiber, 300,000 plants per acre or higher. Uh, cold tolerance, you could see here I have uh, March 25th, the hemp plants already up. April 4th, we have snow. April 5th, the plant recovered. So, this could be also a source for cold tolerance. And you could see the plant in here, uh, two weeks later, it's growing well. Another uh, cold tolerance beside the seedlings is the mature plants. This is October 14. You could see sorghum is dead. Most of the hemp for CBD is dead. We see some of these green plants. So we'll save the seed in here and we'll try to test it for cold tolerance at the maturity stage. So if you are growing hemp for CBD, 
one problem is the farmers have in here in Nebraska and Kansas and the other Midwest when they grow hemp for CBD in the field, because we have so much of the wild pollen that's flowing, the hemp for CBD is going to set seed. And that's going to reduce your CBD concentration by at least 50%. So we need to find a ways to reduce or eliminate seed set on the hemp that's grown for CBD. And one way to do it is several ways. Planting dates, you need to make sure when is the wild hemp flower and trying to avoid that period. So you grow your hemp to overpass the flowering period of the wild hemp. So you don't have intercross between them. You grow your hemp in the greenhouse if it's for C to eliminate the pollen from outside. You surround your hemp for CBD with a few roses of corn or sorghum as a windbreak to eliminate the pollen flow. You could spray chemical on the stigma to kill the stigma. So it won't be receptive to pollen or develop completely sterile plants, male and female sterile. It's like uh, banana, it's like uh, water, seedless watermelon. So if you could develop seedless hemp, that would be ideal for the farmers to grow hemp out in the field. Because one of the uh, bottleneck is growing hemp for CBD out in the field due to the abundance of uh, pollen, wild pollen. You could uh, grow auto flowering. Auto flowering is a hemp blend that flower when it reach maturity, it doesn't matter with the day length. And these are the flower in about 60 days. They call them auto flowering. And that gene came from the Rudialis species. And the last thing is if you are growing hemp for CBD is to go around your field and the neighborhood around you and uh, kill all the wild hemp to eliminate all the pollen that come from there. Okay, so another method to enhance the variability in hemp because we don't have really much uh, to, to work with beside the wild hemp is to uh, generate vari variability for this uh, herbicide resistance, disease resistance by using EMS, ethyl methyl sulfonate mutation. Develop sterile plants by treating the plants with colchicine in an effort to uh, double the chromosome number. So I'm gonna go over this and show you some of the, uh, how what we did it here. We treated the seed with 0.25% EMS and after 12 days and 12 hours, solution, excuse me, in the solution, the plant start germinating. So we separate the plant based on which germinate first, which germinate late, and then we blend them in uh, speedling plants in here. And you could see different uh, rate of uh, development in this EMS. And you could see here, you could see some sign of variegation on the plants after, after the treatments. This is after three weeks from treatments. <clears throat> and you could see some variegation here. That's an indication of hopefully sterility on them, like in other crops. <clears throat> uh, we also use colchicine to double the chromosome number. There are two ways you could do that, use the colchicine. One of them is to soak the seed in colchicine for 12 hours and blend it, or you could uh, treat the meristem. This is after the seedling seeds germinate. We have uh, colchicine solution and with the uh, pipettes in here, you could put a drop of colchicine on the meristem, apical meristem, because it's grown so fast. And then after two, three weeks, you could see some of the stunning and the variegation in it. So after you grow it out, you could see 
This is standard control plants. Look how much seed produce. This is a plant came out of Kulshasin. Only had about seven seeds because there is a chromosome abnormality in it. So when you put uh, pollen from a diploid, it's not going to sit because maybe it's a tetraploid, maybe it's a pentaploid, maybe it's a triploid. So we have to count the chromosome and see how many chromosome, how many genome it has, if it's a triploid or I'm hoping it's going to be triploid because if it's triploid, it means that this one would be ideal to develop varieties that are sterile, male and female sterile. Uh, <clears throat> so breeding hemp, it's exactly like you breed uh, cows or human. It's, it's, it follows the Mendelian inheritance uh, uh, formula. Uh, and, and the only difference is that you cannot self him. It's almost because it doesn't have the male and female parts in it. So you have male and you have female, you cross them, you get the F1, and then to generate F2s, you enter across the F1s. Sibling, you enter across the sibling is like cows. And then the F2 is going to segregate following Mendelian inheritance. You could back cross it. It's the same way you could do it in corn and sorghum. You could generate back cross one, back cross two. The one way you could say, well, I mean, I need selfing it. The only way you could increase the duplicate of your plant is by cloning it. You have clones, you take leaves and then cuttings and then you generate plants. Or you could produce what we call it feminized seed. So feminized seed where you take the female, you treat the female with the gibberellic acid, uh, thiosulfonate, or colloidal silver. I don't know if uh, during the COVID, you, you cannot even buy colloidal silver from Amazon because everybody was using it to, for COVID. But we used it to uh, generate feminized seed. The way you do it, you take the female or the male, the female plants you have in the greenhouse or in the gross chamber, when they start flowering or about to flower, you spray them with colloidal silver for three weeks, twice a day, and the plant will produce seeds. Okay, but they call it feminized seed. And if you are buying feminized seed to grow your crop, it's a dollar a seed. Because that's guarantee you, you are going to get only female plants. Okay, mass selection, it's, that's how they use this uh, method to uh, develop hemp for fiber in Europe back in 50 years ago, where you just have your male and female growing out and you go and select the, uh, based on the phenotype. Here is feminized seed, as I mentioned earlier, you could use uh, colloidal silver, you could use gibberellic acid, or you could use your silver, you could make it uh, at home and you spray the blends with sodium or sodium thiosulfate or silver nitrate, and then you could produce pollen on the blend. So the blend will be able to produce pollen and the pollen will fall in the fe female parts and produce self seed. So that's one way to produce self seed is by producing feminized seed. The other way I mentioned is by taking cuttings. It's very easy. You take uh, small cuttings from the plants, put it in a uh, rooting hormones, put it in the soil, like you see in here. And in 10 days under full lights, you will have a plantlet. You'll have plantlet that you could, it's exactly the same as the female. Back in 2011, we have uh, uh, published in 2015, the sequence of the uh, marijuana genome. 
We don't have the hemp genome sequence here. Many companies are trying to do that. So, and we don't even have also uh, uh, map, gen genetic map for hemp yet. So that's what we need. We use DNA markers for uh, him trying to identify the male. So we could get rid of the male earlier if we don't want it, because if you are growing him for CBD, you don't wanna have any male in your population because the male is going to pollinate the female and the female is going to succeed. And with that happen, that's going to reduce the cannabinoid concentration. So you wanna get rid of the males earlier. And the way you do it, you could use SSR markers and identify the male based on the SSR markers and get rid of them, get rid of them at the early stages. That's another, uh, that was the first one is rabbit. This is SSR markers. And you could see the male have this band in here and the female has this one band in here. So you could go and get rid of all this male that has this band. Uh, uh, I'm working with Tom Clemente also to do genetic transformation. We are trying to increase increase the lipid in the stem, so it could be used as a source for uh, biofuel. So we've been working on the genetic transformation of him for the past three years. So hopefully this year we'll have something to show for it. So what are the biggest obstacles when growing hemp? Hemp is known to be as a miraculous crop, a super uh, crop, but it's not that easy to grow it. There are so many obstacles for, to, for growing hemp. One of them that you need a lot of land, especially if you are growing hemp for seed or for fiber to make profit, like corn. If you don't grow 500 acre, 1000 acre, you are not going to make much money. And there's the same thing applied to hemp especially if you are growing him for grain or fiber. If you are growing him for CBD, you could make lots of money, especially two or three years ago. And there is so much problem with legal issues, especially at the state level and the government level. Most of the farmers now who are growing him, they have to make sure that their crop does not reach higher than 0.3% THC. And if it does, the state will come and destroy your crop. And if you do it, grow it more than one time, and you always have higher THC, they will ban you from growing it. So that's one of the, also the obstacle is that the government has to increase the allowed THC level, or maybe legalize marijuana. And then at that time, hemp will become a crop like corn or soybean. But at this level, when farmers has to make sure that does not reach higher than 0.3%, most of the farmers they grow hemp this last year in Nebraska, got their crop destroyed because the THC level is so influenced by a drought, by nitrogen level. So if you have a dry condition, the THC is going to rise quickly, especially at harvest time. And most of the time, you cannot really find reliable, suitable seed to grow. Most of the seed companies here now in the United States and overseas, they are trying to rush developing varieties for hemp so they could sell the seed. To capture the market. And that's why it's very, it's, it's really not easy to find reliable pure hemp seed. Future of hemp, the future of hemp is so bright. I think it's, uh, there is a huge market for CBD. We need to generate uh, uh, several genetic maps so we'll be able to uh, map the several important genes and that will help us uh, develop varieties quickly. And I will end up with this, showing you this hemp plant that I found growing on the rocks. You could see that on the right. And I would like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues who helped me with this research. Dr. John Reaski is my field technician. 
Chai Zhang, Luke Basta, Ed Cahoon, Tom Clemente, uh, Charlie Soto, and Lugan. They are working with the uh, mapping and the diversity study by sequencing that hopefully will be published this year. With this year, I end up my presentation and uh, thank you for your listening.